Gospels this morning. And in the New Testament, we're going to be in the book of Matthew, chapter 13. We were here a couple of weeks ago before uh, my wife and I got away for a little bit to see some friends that we haven't seen in about five years. And, uh, but uh, I, we had a good time, but it's good to be back home this morning. I'm not real big on entitling sermons, although I do, uh, for my purposes here, I really don't constantly remind you of a title that I put to a sermon because I want you uh, to use your imagination as to what God has for you, and maybe you can put your own title to the sermon this morning, but I've always been fascinated uh, by various literary expressions, figures of speech. Now, I was not real good in English, per se, uh, when I was younger, but somewhere along the way, I had a couple of good English teachers that really uh, taught me uh, English and grammar. And I think about expressions, listen to a few of these, I'm going to give you a little English lesson this morning. Expressions of deception. Here's one for you. Looks can be deceiving. Let me give you an example of that. You've heard the expression, use that in a sentence. Well, let's use it in a sentence. Although the house looked perfect from the outside, it had many issues. And anybody that's bought a house can say amen to that. What, what would we say? Looks can be deceiving. Not everything was as it appeared. Uh, here's here's a, a sentence. He seemed content at his job, but he was actually looking for other opportunities. Not everything's as it appears, right? There's an expression. Think about, so those are expressions of deception. Think about philosophical remarks. There's more here than meets the eye. The quiet student in class turned out to be a mathematical genius. There's more here than meets the eye. Everything that glitters is in gold. I think that's even was made into a song. Think about it like this. The investment seemed like a sure deal, but it turns out that all that glitters isn't gold. And so I could go on and on with many of these warnings about falsehood. Appearances can be misleading. Have you learned that lesson yet? Think about it like this. They acted like experts, but when it came time to deliver the results, their appearances had misled us. Wisdom infused in idioms. Don't judge a book by its cover. You've heard that one before. And I, I think probably we would all say that about ourselves. Hey, don't judge a book always by the cover. There's more there. And she underestimated her opponent because of his age only to be defeated. Don't judge a book by its cover. And so there's more encouragements to dig a little deeper. Think about that. Scratch the surface and discover. Uh, the truth was in the details. Now here's one for you. Looks can be deceiving. Have you learned that one yet? Looks can be deceiving. I mean, they polished that car up really nice. They put some really thick oil in it so it sounds like it's running really smooth. You buy it and you get down the road only to find you're at the mechanic shop. You know what? Looks can be deceiving. Whether you're imparting good advice to people or perhaps just commenting on, on life's unpredictable nature, phrases like this can help us understand the context of things that we deal with in life. Now, as we continue Matthew chapter 13, the Lord uses a, a device here. He uses what we call a parable. And we learned the last time that we met when I was here before Brother Copeland. By the way, thanks again, Brother Copeland, for standing in last week. He did a great job, as always. But one of the things the Lord Jesus addresses here, and how he addresses it, is through what we call a parable. And if you want to name this parable, you would say something like this. The last one I shared with you, looks can be deceiving. Now, a mystery in the New Testament is simply this. It's something that's held in the heart of God, and obviously God knows all things, and God knows a mystery, so nothing's a mystery to God. And in His perfect timing, and for His holy purposes, He will reveal the truth of the mystery. And when we think about the doctrine of the Trinity, 
or we think about the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of Israel. These are mysteries that we don't fully understand, but one day we will in God's timing. And so in these parables, what did the Lord Jesus do? He spoke of things that would be going on literally in our world today. In fact, uh, Paul also talked about these things in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5. through We'll be in Matthew in just a minute. I'm going to give you a number of verses, so I hope you have your Bible. On the back of the bulletin, there's a place to take notes. So just write these verses down. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says this, This know also that in the last days, what days? The days before the Lord Jesus returns. Do you realize this morning that one of these days, see everything seems to go on as it's always gone on. You get up, you go to that job, you drive that car, you leave that house, you do your job, you come back home in that car to that house, and you do it all over again. Maybe you get some free time. Maybe you get some enjoyment here and there. You purchase some things. You, you uh, have some hobbies. You watch some TV. But one of these days, the trumpet's going to sound, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to rock your world and rock my world. This know also in the last days, perilous times will come. And the things we see going on with Israel right now, the things we see going on in the world, Jesus said in Matthew 24, these are just the beginning of sorrows. These are just the birthing pains before the delivery. What's the delivery? The great tribulation for Israel and for the world. So Paul goes on here, he says, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Now see if this sounds like our day. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Do you realize, kids, that's a sign of the end times? Unthankful, unholy. Here's one for you. Without natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. And, and listen to this. Does this not sound like America? Christianity wrapped in the American dream. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Somebody here this morning, you'd rather be out on the lake in a boat than you would rather be here, but you're here, and I thank God that you are here. A lot of people today, they'd rather be having pleasure, and there is pleasure in sin for a season, but folks, the payoff's coming. And he goes on, having a form of godliness. Oh, you talk to these folks, and, and they're going to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but their life says something totally different. You see, looks can be deceiving, and they might have a form of God in this, but they deny the power thereof. And Paul told Timothy, from such, turn away. Now, the, again, the last time we spoke, what did we talk about? The sower and the seed. We talked about that. And we talked about how that in that parable, that the sower is the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed is the word of God. But this morning we come to yet another parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 13, and it's called the parable of the wheat and the tares. And I'm going to tell you, when you look at these two, you will know what I mean when I say looks can be deceiving. So together, let's look at Matthew chapter number 13, and let's begin reading in verse number 24, if you would please. I'll give you just a second to get there. And it says, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, these are his servants, these sowers, his enemy came and he sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went his way. But when the blades sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and, and said unto him, Sir, didst thought thou not sow good seed in thy field? Well, from whence hath tares in it, or why does it have tares in it? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servants said unto him, Wilt thou go, uh, that we go and uh, gather them up? In other words, out into the fields, there's wheat and there's tares. 
uh, master, do you want us to go out there and tear the, the tares out of the wheat? And listen to what he says. Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until, here comes the payoff, until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So I want you to notice, as we're given this parable by the Lord Jesus, the first thing that I notice here is an apparent dilemma, an apparent dilemma. In fact, there are similarities and differences that are mentioned in this parable that Jesus doesn't use in any other parable in all of the Bible. Now, Notice how the Lord Jesus describes both these similarities and the differences, both the wheat and the tares. Notice, first of all, he describes a complex sowing. A complex sowing in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like, or just like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went his way. So the sowing is different from the sowing made in this previous parable, the one of the Word of God. The Lord Jesus was sowing the Word of God, but it's different here. He's no longer sowing the Word of God. And notice what is being sown in verse 37. Jesus explains this parable by saying, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's Jesus. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Anyone saved here this morning? Then you are a child of the king, amen? But the, but the tares, notice this, the tares are the children of the wicked one. So the seed spoken of in this parable is not the same as before. This is not the word of God. This right here is people. The Lord Jesus has now sown people into the world. Who are these people that have been sown into the world? They are the ones that followed the word of God and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. They are the ones with the good soil. The seed found good soil and it rooted and as it rooted, and then those, those roots sought nourishment and water, it began to grow. And as it grew, it did what? It bore fruit. And so it was evident what happened. We understand that there were three other types of soil upon which the Word of God was sown. Last time we learned that. And again, I remind you this morning, there's four types of soil here. And, and three of the four will not hear what I have to say today. They, oh, they'll hear with their ears, but they'll not hear with their heart. They'll, they'll take note of what that preacher said, but they're not going to apply it to the need of their life. Only 25% or one out of the four will take that word to heart and act on it. So again, the saved ones, the ones that had the seed fall on that good fertile soil. If you come in this morning prayed up, prepared to hear from God, can I tell you this morning your heart is fertile soil? And, 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 it, and it's just like I prayed before I come. God, simply fill my mind with your thoughts, my mouth with your words. God, I am just a, a mouthpiece. All glory goes to you. I'm just a man. I'm nothing without you. And so even when the Word of God goes forth, it's not Rick Ross that does anything. It's the Word of God. But it's a necessity this morning that the Word of God finds itself to rest in fertile soil that's prepared to hear what this old gray-haired, bald, fat man has to say. Because what I'm saying is the Word of God this morning. So the saved are those that have been to the old rugged cross. The saved are those that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The saved are those that who have accepted that incorruptible, infallible seed of the Word of God and allowed it to produce life in their dead spirit. You go, I'm dead? Before Jesus Christ comes into your life, you're dead. 
The Bible says that we were all dead in trespasses and sin in times past. But you hath he quickened. The saved are quickened by the Spirit. Now, you teens that stayed up last night, last night at Six Flags, you're going to stay awake this morning or I'm going to call you out by name, amen? So just pay attention. That's, a good, that's good advice, trust me. They didn't get home to 120. And so uh, I'm like, mm -hmm, because I, I, I know it's hard to stay awake sometimes when you're young. I remember I worked, I worked a job, and we'd be sitting around over there, Pastor Reed would be preaching. I'd get home to 1 o'clock from Wendy's or K-Bob's or Western Sizzling, and I'd be over there going like that, doing that. And, but, boy, if you fell asleep, boy, he would light you up from the pulpit. Now, I don't typically do that, but this morning, you know what? We want to be focused on the Lord Jesus, amen, and we want to hear the word of God. So the good seed of which the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking of here is that seed that is present in our parable today. It's not the word of God now. It's those that have received the word of God. It's the born-again children of the kingdom. 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. Again, you can jot these down. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. This is when Jesus comes. But we know that when he, Jesus, shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope does what? Purifies himself even as he, Jesus, is pure. So those that are saved, we have a desire to live clean lives, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's put in our hearts, not because we're good, we're bad. The heart is desperately wicked, and who, the, and who can know it? But the Holy Spirit of God in us, that day that we were saved, that day that we were born again, He's the one that desires to live the life of Christ through you and I, amen? And so here we are, the Lord Jesus talks about the two different types of seed that's been sown, and He says, He answered in verse 37 unto them, He that sowed the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. So the good seed, the children of God, are being sown. But notice the bad seed. Now this goes against the uh, psychology of the world today. Because the psychologists say, well, the world is getting better and better. Uh, no, it's not. And you can't show any of us that. Just look on the news for a little while. Just hear what I hear over at the gun store uh, of people and things that happen to them right here in Wichita Falls. And, and I want to tell you something, folks. Uh, it's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're the good seed. So we've been sown into the world. After we got saved, we were saved out of this world to go back into this world so that we can, through our testimony... And through sharing what we learn through the Word of God, we can, we can help others come to faith in Christ so that they can be saved out of the world. Amen? But folks, there's a bad seed in the world. And the devil has sowed this. And Jesus said they are the children of the wicked one that have been sowed. So what are the, what's the case here? The righteous are characterized as wheat, while the wicked are characterized as tares, and they've both been planted, the saved by the Lord Jesus, the lost by the devil himself. And I'm going to tell you this morning, they are both in the world today, and they are both in churches today. You think the church is exempt from, uh, the, uh, from the wicked one sowing his tares among the wheat? Absolutely not. I'll tell you one of the most worldly places in this world are churches. I don't say that with joy, but with a tear in my eye, because it ought not be that way, amen? But unfortunately, just like politics, churches have gone astray. Pastors have gone astray. And there's false prophets preaching a false gospel, a false message in a pulpit in a false church right now as I'm speaking to you this morning. So the tares are those, by the way, they may profess salvation, but they do not possess salvation. See, I can say anything. Hey, Brother Willie, did you know that I'm a billionaire? Well, Pastor, I didn't know that. Well, I'm not. Actually, I could just say it. It doesn't mean anything. 
I don't have a dollar in the bank just because I said that. And there's a lot of people saying, I'm a Christian. You know what it means to be a Christian? It means that I am actively following the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. It's not anything else but that. It's not that I belong to a church. It's not that I shook a pastor's hand 20 years ago. It's not that I knelt at an altar and cried crocodile tears because I was living my life like a dummy. It's none of that. It's that it's, we have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and his grace and his mercy, and we've been saved and bought by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. All glory goes to him. And so, here we are. It's easy to say anything. But friend, if your life don't, Re reflect that and if your life don't project that then and let me tell you whatever it is you think you got that you're calling Christianity or salvation is not the Christianity of the Bible when Jesus called those men those disciples Simon Peter and Andrew what did he say he said you follow me and they did when he blinded the, uh, Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, Paul's, or, uh, Saul at that time, before Christ changed his name, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And it was, follow me. He said, go here. And, and by the way, the, those apostles would later say, Lord, we have left all and followed thee. Amen? That's what it means to be a child of God. That's what it means to be a Christian. So what do we see? It's a complex sowing here. In the world and in the church, we have both wheat and tares. But notice also a crucial growing in verse 26. Jesus goes on to explain by saying, but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. In the, in, in the days of our text, in, in our days today, no farmer goes out and tills the ground and plants seed and just forgets about it. What is he expecting? He's expecting a harvest. By the way, we're, we're moving into that time. Wheat harvest has passed, but we're moving in that time where it's harvest. We celebrate the harvest in October, and everything's turning green. Everything is harvesting. My, my pecan tree in my front yard is putting down pecans so my squirrels can have food for the winter because I sure am not getting them. What's going on? It's a harvest. And, and that's what they would do. It, it's something that was done, by the way, year after year. Every year, seed would be sown, and every year a harvest would be expected. And by the way, if you planted corn, what did you expect? Did you expect to get uh, spinach? No, you expected corn. If you, if you sowed uh, a wheat, like here in our text, what did, it was popular in ancient times, and very uh, much a necessity, for bread and for uh, food, what would you expect? You would expect to get a harvest of wheat. But folks, I want you to understand, there's something going on here. There's a secret sowing that has taken place. You see, after that man's crop was planted, an enemy came, and, and Jesus doesn't really uh, in-depth describe in the context of the parable the reason why he did it, but I can tell you it would be disastrous when you've got tilled soil and furrows of, of, of newly planted wheat for somebody to go out there into that field and to plant weeds. And that's basically what a tear is. A, a tear, uh, they believe, was what is called a darnel uh, in ancient times. And what's interesting about a darnel was when it would, as it was growing, it, from, the, from a, the edge of a field, you really couldn't tell the difference. It looked just like wheat. But it was a tear. And so there's tares and there's wheat. And so we are here today. There's tares and there's wheat, both in our world the wheat sown by the Lord Jesus, the tares sown by the enemy. And they're also in the church today. You know what the purpose of a tear would, would, would possibly be in this? To spoil the harvest. Why would the enemy, in this case, who is the devil, 
sow tares, non-believers, among the wheat. By the way, I want you to hear something this morning. Listen to me. That word among in the original Greek language, and I don't spend a lot of time giving you Greek and Hebrew and all that. You're not a scholar and neither am I, okay? So we just talk in English here, amen? Just plain old country plowboy English. You know what it means among? Every other one. What that means is, if we were to apply that, let's, let's, let's apply it to this crowd right here. And I'm not going to pick on these good gentlemen up here on the front row, so let me start on the second row. Uh, so there's Miss Sarah, wheat. There's Landon, a tear. There's Keaton, wheat. There's Alex, a tear. Man, that worked out perfectly. <laughs> but do you, get the, do you get the picture? The enemy sowed tares among the wheat. And so it is in our world, and so it is in the church today. What, what, what has happened right here? He's sown lost, unsaved, evil, unrighteous in and among the saved and the righteous. Not that we're, again, not that we are in it of, of ourselves anything good. Paul said it, no good thing dwells in me except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And so what do we see? The devil has sown darkness in the midst of the light in, in, for what purpose? In hopes to destroy God's plan for mankind. That's it. And he's put, listen, in your life, if you're weak this morning, if you're saved and you know that, that's settled. For me, I played church for a long time. I guarantee you, I was in that baptistry up there, and I was in the baptistry over there. I mean, I've been, I was in the baptistry at Faith Village on Ray Road and Thomas. Uh, I, I've been, what? I, I, I was making these emotional decisions over and over again, but nothing changed in my life. And I went out in my early 20s and, and lived uh, my, I call it my stupid years. I was not pleasing to God, that's for sure. And I wasn't, I was breaking the heart of my parents. Why? They raised me to be one way. The problem was I was unsaved in the church. But July 26, 1992, sitting on the back row right back there, it's like Jesus himself came and sat down beside me, and I, I literally ran to meet the pastor when he came out of the baptistry and said, Pastor, i got to get saved. He took me to that end room, classroom up there, and I told you the story before. And he said, Rick, I don't need to go over all this with you. You've been raised here since you were a 12-year-old boy. You know it. He said, let's get on our faces before God, and let's get you saved right now. And I confessed my sins and begged God to forgive me of all that I'd done, including the false professions, and said, God, I don't understand all this. I want to be saved. I want to be born again. And folks, although I'm not perfect, and I've made a lot of mistakes since that day, you know what? There's never been a doubt in my heart that I'm a born-again child of God. I became wheat that day because I was living like a tear before that. You've heard parents use that expression, my son's like a holy tear. I, I wouldn't apply the word holy to a tear, but that's kind of what the expression means right there. So whenever and wherever you find God sowing, what? What's he doing? He's sowing people into the world. And if you are here today as a child of God, I'm going to tell you right now, God has sown you. He saved you for a purpose, amen? And what do we say here at Liberty? We're not saved to sit, we're saved to... Amen. We serve one another, and we serve the community, but most of all, we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't clock in and out. It's 24-7, 365, baby. Amen? That's who we live for. So whether we're here or whether we're down at our job, it doesn't matter. We're serving Jesus, Amen? And it doesn't matter if, uh, I, I, I want to tell you, I want to share something with you, and I don't know if I've shared this yet, but, and, and, and I miss my dad, and, and I know Brother David's here, and his dad recently passed, and my heart goes out to uh, Brother Garcia because he was best of friends with his father, and I was best of friends with my father. And it, what was really cool, there's a guy that came in the gun store uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he had an M1 shirt on, and that's the company that my dad worked for out the base for 35 years, and uh, we got to talking. I saw his shirt, and, uh, and uh, I said, hey, how long have you been out there? And he goes, I've been out there about 17, 18 years. I said, do you know Jack Ross? <laughs> he said, 
You better believe I do. In fact, I was with your dad when he went to be with the Lord. He was the one that gave my dad CPR. And what was cool about that is I got to meet him, and he said, you know what? You look just like your dad. I said, my poor dad. <laughs> he had good hair. I don't have good hair. But the face, we, you know, we look just alike. But here's what was awesome. He said, no one that worked out at that base has any doubt right now where that man is because everybody knew who he lived for and who he served. And he told me this. He said, he was on his, on his creeper there. We're working. And one of the guy, young guys working with us kept hitting his head on the bottom of this T-38 jet. And he said, Jack was laughing. And we were laughing and having a good time. And then Jack wasn't laughing. I said, oh, yes, he was. He was laughing over in heaven. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Amen. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What do we see right here? A, a, a parent dilemma in this parable. God, his desire is to sow wheat. Amen? Listen, God wants you to be wheat this morning. He don't want you to be a tear and die and go to hell. I, I had some kids on my church band I run on Wednesday night. And it, it came to my attention that they were planning to be bad before they even got to church. And uh, I guess they planned on being bad on the way home from church because they were being bad in the van. And I said, guys, why would you come to church and then planning to be bad? I said, we go to church to learn about Jesus. We, come, we go to church to worship God and to want to be bad is not good. And I said, you, I said, one of the things that we know, every one of us, every one of us, is that every single one of us will one day die. It's appointed, uh, Hebrews 9, uh, 12, it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment, after that, you will stand before God. And you will either stand at the Bema seat of God, where he gives you rewards for the life you live, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, where you will be your soul in eternity and what you will have for all eternity is based, determined right now, today, on what you do with Jesus Christ and what you do for Jesus Christ. Amen? And there's people that go, you know what, I don't, I don't believe that, I don't need that. Well, let me tell you, you're still going to die. And when you die, you will then believe, I promise you. The Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will one day confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the saved, amen, in praise and worship and that's the lost in horrible realization that they were wrong, eternally wrong. And one of the things I said was, do you realize when we die, because we are, we will always be, amen? We are eternal creatures. There's no annihilation. Just You can burn it up. You can bury it. It don't matter. You, your soul lives for all eternity. And let me tell you something, friend. 10,000 years into eternity, and it, you won't even be close to a probation. 10 billion years into eternity, you won't even be close to the judge saying, you know what, you've served long enough, you're done. It's forever. I know, our mind, I know my mind cannot comprehend that. And I'm not trying to scare you this morning, but I'm telling you this morning, heaven is for real and it's for all eternity, praise Jesus. And it's not this communistic, we all get a participation award and it's all the same for everybody. But to think that somebody like me would get the same rewards as somebody like the Apostle Paul, no way. I'm going to be somewhere way in the back of the line, I'm sure. Heaven's going to be sweet, amen? It's going to be good. And any crown I get, a soul winner's crown, a crown for ministry, praise God, and, uh, and, and, and we'll lay down our crowns at the feet of Jesus, amen? And I think he's going to give them back to us and say, this is for you. This shows all of heaven that you faithfully served me. I believe that with all my heart. There's not this communistic, socialistic, Kami Kamala, everybody gets equity. By the way, I believe in equality. Amen? We're all the same. 
red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in Jesus' sight. I don't believe in equity. I don't believe just because you have something I don't have that it ought to be taken away from you and given to me just because we're people. The Bible says very specifically, if a man won't work, he don't eat. Amen? And I'll tell you straight up, if I find somebody that, that needs help, and I'll help everybody, I, I try to, but if a person's not tithing, I've got to be very careful not to stand in the middle of ju God's judgment on them and say, God's judging them and not providing for them because they won't trust him and tithe, and then here I am interfering with what God's doing to try to get them to understand the word of God in Malachi 3 and do it. Amen? An apparent dilemma. What is it? There's weed and there's tares amongst us this morning. And you've got to decide right now today which you are. Because, friend, there's the Lord of the wheat, Jesus, and there's the Lord of the tares, the devil. And let me tell you, the one thing the devil don't want you to know today is that you're lost. He wants to tell you, you know what? You remember what you did? Oh, I, I'm not living for Jesus. I mean, my life doesn't look anything like the, what the, the Holy Book says. Well, it's okay. You, you, you're trying hard, you know, the devil says. It's okay. You don't have to accept the Lord Jesus. Just, just turn over a new leaf and try to do a little bit better. Friend, you'll die a tear. I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I'm going to die a weed. Amen? And you know what? The tares were gathered and, 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 and here it is, gathered and bound up and burned. The wheat was gathered into the barn that belonged to the master. So this morning, wheat or tares? Let's stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, we're grateful for your love and your son Jesus and for your holy word. And God, my mind goes back and I can just see Jesus on the Judean hillside sharing this very word with a group of people no doubt many of them were farmers. Many of them worked in the harvest. And they understood this parable very well. That in our world, and sadly in our churches, there are the wheat, praise God. Those that have been bought by the blood of the Lamb, born again, saved, redeemed. John wrote, in your divine inspiration, God. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. The reality is this morning, every person can know and every person should know that when they leave here today, they're wheat. And proof in the pudding, to use another expression, is there's fruit. If there's no fruit, there's no root. God, we see that plainly demonstrated in this parable, and we'll come back to it again next week, God. And we'll talk more in depth about uh, the aggravating discovery that the, that the owner of the field finds, and, and when he finds this, and what happens. But Lord, the decision is ours today in the field in which we are living of what we're going to be. Sown by God or sown by the devil? By default, we are tears. We're weeds. But when we come to Christ, he can change us. You said in your word, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. And Lord, one of the, one of the things that we know is if we are saved, if we are truly Christians, we will bear spiritual fruit. The things that we used to hate about God and church and the Bible, we love now. The things that we used to not want to do, those are the things that we want to do, Lord. And the things that we used to love to do, a lot of those things are the things that we know we better not be doing those things. And it's not doing things or not doing things that saves us. Because God, you said in your word, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto 
good works. Father, that verse 10 right there, that is the fruit that comes from the root of our salvation. So each of us this morning, we have, a, we have some examination to do. Oh God, to look at the, from the edge of the field at a, at a harvest, we can't tell in and among us who, who are the wheat and who are the tares. But God, we each know in our heart what we are. So God, my prayer this morning is simply this, that you would have your will and your way. Your word would not return void. You would save the lost. You would add to your harvest. Jesus is coming soon. We believe it by faith. And we, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But God, there's someone here today, maybe somebody listening online. They need to make that decision. They need to make that decision and they need to accept the Lord of the harvest as Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. And for the Christian this morning, God, some of us, we need, to, we need to quit letting the tares mess with us. They're getting in our lane. They're distracting us, and they're keeping us from being and doing what you would have us to be and do. God, help us to focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, knowing that Jesus is coming soon. And we want to hear him say, I think everyone does, I know my dad did. I know Brother Garcia, his dad did. Just to simply hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, have your will and your way in this invitation in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Some of